Okay, everybody, we're going to get started with the next one, if I could get your attention here. So next up, we have James Woodward, and he's going to be doing... <laughs> James Woodard is going to be doing the role of institutions and rationality. Can I get everyone's attention? Quiet, please. <laughs> okay, so we're going to have up next is James Woodward. His presentation is the role of institutions and rationality in the emergence of an obesity epidemic. And James Woodward is a doctoral student in the Martin School of Public Policy and Administration at the University of Kentucky. And his research interests include policy analysis, behavioral economics, and nutrition policy. And go ahead, Dave. Thanks. Hi, everybody. I'd first like to thank the organizers for putting this event together and allowing me to present. My name is James Woodward, and I'm a PhD candidate in public policy, as she said. Uh, I hope that by the end of this talk, I can convince you all that aspects of economic theory, including rationality and institutions, can add to our explanations for the origins of the obesity epidemic in the United States. Although my analysis is mainly informed by the American context, we being pioneers in this regard, I believe it could also be applied to other nations as well. So this slide gives some indication of just how complex the world of dieting may appear to consumers. I pulled these words in terms from last year's AHS program and added some prevalent terms from more conventional points of view. It is by no means an exhaustive list. It does make one wonder how anyone is able to make eating decisions at all. Before going any further, I should point out that I have little to no training in nutrition, medicine, or public health. I did, however, lose a great deal of weight by following a high-fat, low-carb, paleo-inspired diet while liberally applying the 80-20 principle. But I do not intend to advocate for that or any other dietary strategy to alleviate obesity. I'm inclined to agree with, agree with Joan Rivers, who once said, diets like clothes should be tailored to you. The question I wish to address is, how do we understand an obesity epidemic as a market outcome resulting from the behavior and choices of rational agents, that is, consumers? This may sound like a naive or obtuse question, but I hope to show why this is a re reasonable starting point for my analysis. So this graph shows what we're dealing with and how quickly we got here, in case anyone was unaware. And here's a state-by-state -state breakdown, uh, my home state and the state I'm living in now are not doing quite as well as Kentucky or uh, California, as you can see. Um, but as you can see, obesity is associated with a number of far more serious health conditions and is a significant driver of health care costs. These are the reasons policymakers and the public at large ultimately care about obesity. They also provide some preliminary evidence that there is, may be a further role for public policy to play. So many of the talks at AHS have been concerned with the sometimes controversial relationships between diet and health in individuals, including obesity. While such work is obviously important and needed, to explain an epidemic, we need more. Social phenomena require explanations at the population level, and as a result, fairly strong assumptions about individual behavior. Given the extent of this controversy, a good explanation for an obesity epidemic should be general enough to incorporate risk and uncertainty about these relationships. We should prefer a general framework for understanding and explaining market behavior until some of these questions are settled. One that is robust to our potential changes in our understanding of the relationships between diet and health, including obesity. So my goals for this talk are the following. Briefly summarize the dominant perspectives from public health and economics, which are widely accepted and applied in the literature. Point out the insights and limitations associated with each. Provide some additional economic terms and concepts, as well as their relevance to this market explain and walk through my own model and its implications, and wrap up with some concluding remarks and hopefully some questions from you guys. So in public health, the focus is on the toxic food environment and how it impacts our purchasing decisions. And the primary insight here is that healthy choices are not automatic and are made difficult by an environment filled with unhealthy choices and producers who are not necessarily economically motivated to optimize their customers' health and they may use misleading advertising, labeling, and marketing practices. As someone with a background in economics, I'm inclined to ask a couple of questions. Where did this environment, that is the market for food, come from? We, as humans, have a great deal of control over our environment and are generally considered pretty intelligent. Why make it a toxic one? Further, how does the individual actually deal with this environment? Before I get into the economic approach, I'm going to throw a bit of economic jargon at you, so try to stay awake. <laughs> 
First off, a model is a necessary simplification of reality. It focuses our attention on the most salient aspects of a problem and importantly allows for statistical an analysis and hypothesis testing. As I said earlier, public health models tend to focus on the environment. Economists tend to treat individuals as rational, meaning they are goal-oriented and capable of making, ranking their choices based on their preferences and the total prices of goods, including the health costs. Methodological individualism is, a, is an approach in economics which says that any explanations for social phenomena should be intelligible from the perspective of a rational agent. A utility function is simply a mathematical translation of your preferences. Uh, more utility is better, all else equal. Finally, an opportunity cost is the cost to you of doing what you're doing versus what else you could do with your time or money. So with that out of the way, based on my reading of the literature, economists tend to argue that our environment is actually a reflection of the individual preferences of rational agents who are maximizing their total utility given their alternatives and dietary knowledge. In short, obese consumers either don't know how to avoid obesity and or they don't care enough to do anything about it. The insight here is that not everyone wants to be skinny or even healthy. Individual preferences and total utility matter a great deal, as do opportunity costs. We cannot assume people already know what a healthy diet is. Learning about and adhering to a diet are both costly endeavors. And additionally, people are not required to be as physically active as they were in the past. But is this sufficient to explain a drastic uptick in obesity over such a short period? Are, really, are Americans really that apathetic and short-sighted? Before I answer that question, I would like to point out the broader areas of agreement between these two models. Both emphasize calories, exercise, fat, fruits and vegetables, and perhaps a couple other factors. Both models indicate that the problem ultimately lies in individuals' inability to adhere to a rate-reducing diet in their current environment and future policy interventions are likely to emphasize these same characteristics. Which brings us back to this slide. <laughs> in my view, market complexity is not well incorporated into the previous two models. There is a multitude of diet-related issues that consumers could worry about that may affect their dietary choices with regard to health. Yet the majority of the populace has, been successful, has seemingly been successful in managing this complexity and avoiding obesity but a large mi and growing minority have seemingly lost this ability in recent decades. How can we reconcile complexity, large incentives to avoid obesity, and a not completely dysfunctional market outcome? That is, obesity rates are not yet 100%. A change of perspective might help. That is, an obese rational agent has a large incentive to learn more about diet and health. Are the short-term benefits to eating poorly that high? Shouldn't individuals make a trade-off at some point? Why has zero or negative market learning occurred in spite of decades-long efforts to ec educate consumers and a wide array of diets being offered in the market? There are a couple potential explanations. Perhaps the environment really is that bad and or preferences are highly stable and persistent. But what if we include a preference for no obesity? Can we create a model that incorporates environmental constraints and complexity? I think so, but we'll need a few more terms. <laughs> First of all, we can, rather than treat each food item as an economic good in itself, we can treat it as a bundle of characteristics. So consumers actually purchase and trade off for the bundle of characteristics which they most prefer. Credence, a credence good is one that requires a third party in order to fully evaluate its costs and benefits due to market complexity or a lack of knowledge. So I think a good example is auto repair. Many of us don't really know what's going on under the hood and we need a mechanic to tell us. So, Another term we, I think that's relevant is satisficing. The social scientist Herbert Simon argued that consumers are unlikely to become fully informed in a market with many potential sources of information. It would actually be irrational to try to find out all the information you might need to know about your dietary decisions. It would take a great deal of time and effort. Institutions are social structures that can help to alleviate complexity and guide our decisions in a variety of settings. Examples include money, culture, and family. In this domain, science, nutrition, medicine, and public policy are quite salient, although other, others clearly matter as well. Institutions tell us which characteristics of the world we should pay attention to. They affect our menu of choices, in other words. Bounded rationality refers to the fact in, that in the real world, there are many areas where full rationality is unlikely to occur, but institutions can help overcome this problem. 
In this context, a commitment device is simply a fancy term for a diet. I think it's safe to say that in this market, that this market is not working efficiently, indicating there may be some role for policy. Which brings me to my model. Rather than read through each of these boxes, I will walk through it using a few illustrative examples based on my own experience and two hypothetical situations. I reference my own experience only because it is the one with which I am most familiar, and I don't think it is particularly unique in most respects. When I use the term iterative, this refers to the fact that um, the act of repeating a process with the aim of approaching a desired goal, target, or result. Sounds like dieting to me. First, let's go through an idealized outcome. So we start at the top here, and we have a consumer with preferences that lead him to eat a standard American diet that's more or less unhealthy. Until he decides he's too fat, and that's a personal judgment, he's likely to continue that pattern of diet until he decides he is too fat, in which case he will search for information. In all likelihood, he's likely to follow these institutions and the, the commitment devices they lead to, update his preferences, and including using some psychological variables, and finally make a choice. Now, there are two options. His utility could go, in the ideal case, his weight goes down, his utility goes up, he continues doing what he's doing, or he continues to optimize, or and, and basically stop the process, okay? My own experience was that I became obese. I answered yes to this question. I searched for information. I adhered to this advice, made choices, and found myself more miserable than ever and not losing weight. <laughs> so I decided to wade into literature, convince my, into these alternative sources of information. Uh, I deemed I decided that paleo probably wasn't going to kill me and decided to uh, make that change. I continue to adjust and optimize according to my prefer preferences, constraints, and any new information. So the trickier case is what if someone goes through this process and finds his utility lower but doesn't, doesn't go to these alternative sources of information? There are a couple of options. He could revert to his old behavior or he could retry this. It's not clear how many times it would be rational to retry this process if you're not seeing results. The takeaway here is that giving people advice is only the beginning and may not lead to predictable outcomes for a variety of reasons. Seeking out information, changing preferences, and behavior can be costly and difficult, especially when there is a significant risk and uncertainty involved. I see producers as playing a somewhat passive, though, am though ambiguous role in this whole process since they are also responding to policy and these societal institutions as well, as well as consumer demand, of course. I think that my model shows that consumers require credible institutions to define what a healthy diet means so that they can make good eating decisions. For better or worse, probably worse, the conventional wisdom is endorsed by most in the fields of nutrition and medicine and is tacitly accepted as fact by other disciplines, for example, public health and economics. So the conventional wisdom has a large market advantage in defining a healthy diet, aided by public policy in the form of labeling, information provision, regulation, and licensing. Current models do not fully address the costs of changing preferences, nor the incentives to do so, and data quality mean conclusions depend on model assumptions. It's very difficult to tell what's actually going on in the real world with, all, with regards to all of this. So this map illustrates the extent to which registered dietitians enjoy a market advantage in the provision of dietary advice. Even in green-colored states, they may be treated preferentially by insurance companies. In general, such professional regulations tend to prevent a level playing field in the competition over ideas, though they have clearly been deemed credible by both government and the public. So it's perfectly rational, in this sense, to go to RD for advice. So I believe there are several interesting implications of my model. For one, the obesity epidemic is emergent. It's not preferred by anyone involved in this process, but the result of a costly choice problem that is difficult to solve due to a variety of constraints that may vary significantly from person to person. In order to, to distinguish the precise nature of this problem, we would need very detailed information about why and precisely how much of each food characteristic each individual consumes. Risk and uncertainty at all levels about the nature of diet and health relationships should be acknowledged 
and incorporated into models to arrive at a plausible and explanation, plausible and robust explanation for an obesity epidemic. So to summarize, these new non-ancestral institutions compete with the old ones and they have a distinct market advantage. It is not clear whether they do so, they enhance decision making way, in a way that enhances the efficiency of consumers' choices, especially with regard to obesity. This may explain why some dietary approaches, approaches are not able to outcompete ineffective ones, leading to inefficient choices and inefficient, undesirable outcomes. My model is actually adaptable to other diet-related outcomes, diet-related health outcomes, if you just replace the obesity slide with some other health problem. Um, we may need to acknowledge the heterogeneity, both, regard, both with regard to physiology and decision-making processes, and place our emphasis on different characteristics or sets of characteristics. An important caveat is that my model does not incorporate the physiological or psychological effect of food itself on demand, only information, experience, and preferences. But these factors could also be incorporated into it. So if wheat or sugar are addictive, for example, and the, consu the obese consumer is unaware of this, her problem becomes that much more difficult. Uh, my references. Thank you for listening. <laughs> we can do about one or two questions. Anybody right here? Okay. Hi, thanks for the talk. Um, I'm just wondering if you will consider the fact that not everyone has the same choice mm -hmm. um, capacity and therefore it's not only a matter of choosing an alternative but a lot of people don't have a choice they cannot access to a different they, they cannot access to knowledge that in my presentation people are constrained by this power structure mm -hmm. whereby you know people in Ecuador for example believe whatever comes from the official institutions and right. therefore they don't have that choice other people don't have the economic capacity. So um, I'm wondering what, what your thoughts are on that. Well, like I said, in America, we do have a choice of what we can eat. I mean, everyone in this, in this room seems to have made some healthy, healthier decisions. Um, I would just point that out. Uh, and what was the second part of your question? I'm sorry. <laughs> yeah, uh, well, I don't think that everyone in America has a choice because Okay. Some people are, you know, privileged to have right. the economic means and, you know, the, the access. There is such thing as food deserts mm -hmm. and right. people are stuck there and so they don't have a choice. Well, first and of all, uh, the food desert might be an outcome of all this, I would say. And second, I would say that the relative costs of making this choice to, to change your diet far outweigh the, the relative benefits, that is, far outweigh the relative costs of whatever effort it takes to do this at least in theory from a rational perspective. So I, I, I certainly accept that it's very difficult for some people, and especially for the, the impoverished and, and so on. One more question here. What happens to your model when you discover that humans are not rational? <laughs> I mean, what happens to any economic model once you question rationality as an assumption? Uh, Right, well, like I said, that was sort of my starting point, and I think I pointed out some, some reasons why we can't assume full rationality in this context. And there are a lot of contexts where full rationality is not, not likely to obtain. And I, I do agree that economists tend to ignore that fact in a lot of cases. It sort of renders problematic most of your conclusions, in my view. Well, I would say that the obese have a very large incentive to pursue the goal of alleviating their own obesity. I mean, that was my experience. Um, so I think that if you don't think people are rational and you're trying to explain this obesity epidemic, you're essentially saying that 30% of the population has all of a sudden, I don't know, is less rational than the other 60%? I'm, I'm not sure. No, I think you're looking for other social forces that might include irrationality, rationality, but a whole bunch of other issues. I, sh I, I guess I should point out that rationality also assumes Knowledge, full information, full information and knowledge of what you're choosing, and that's clearly not what's going on in this market. So you're right, full rationality is not going on here. But I do think that consumers are goal-oriented in that and able to rank their choices. That's about as far as I'll go. <laughs>
Thank you. <laughs> okay.